Welcome to this very special measurement and evaluation panel session brought to you by ResCom, which is the research community of the Public Relations Institute of Australia. I'm Barbara Ryan, and today we'll hear about trends in measurement and evaluation in research as they appear on the research radar. This is just one of a suite of ResCom's Global Measurement Month activities. And Measurement, measurement Month is coordinated each year by AMEC, the International Association for the Measurement and Evaluation of Communication. But first, I'd like to honour and pay respects to the Waka Waka people who are custodians of the land where I'm located and to all the First Nations custodians across Australia. We acknowledge and recognise the significance of our shared history. We support the continued connections of First Nations people to country and we're committed to further strengthening relationships between First Nations and non-First Nations people. So our theme for this year's Measurement Month is reimagining measurement and evaluation. And critical to this is reimagining so this reimagining is the research published in our PR mm -hmm. academic journals. So today we have on the panel the editors of a number of our key journals, and we'll get their perspectives on a, a few of the questions relating to measurement, evaluation and learning. So Maureen, Professor Maureen Taylor is uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Public Relations Review and heads the Public Relations Program at the University of Technology, Sydney. Professor Taylor's specialisation is measurement and evaluation of community engagement, in which she's undertaken projects and research for the UN, World Health Organisation, USAID, and our own Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. She's a fellow of the International Communication Association and is currently working with the World Health Organisation International, Geneva, to provide strategic communication and monitoring and evaluation advice for WHO's COVID-19 campaigns and World Health Days. Professor Christine Huang currently serves as editor for the journals Communication and the Public and Communication and Society and is based at the University of Hong Kong. She also serves as senior associate editor for the Journal of Public Relations Research and is an editorial board member of the Journal of Communication, Communication Theory and Public Relations Review and many others. Professor Huang was appointed a fellow of the ICA this year. She's a multiple award winning researcher in the fields of strategic communication management, risk communication in health and technology, crisis communication, relationship management and cross-cultural communication. Dr. Bailing Shah is Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Public Relations Research and is based at California State University Fullerton, where she is the Dean of, College of, of the College of Communications. In that role, she heads the only communications college in the entire 23 campus system of the California State University, which is the largest system of public higher education in the US. Dr. Shah's research examines the intersection of identity and public relations. With Dr. Glenn Broom, Dr. Shah co-authored the 11th edition of Cutlip and Centre's Effective Public Relations, one of the world's leading public relations textbooks. Dr. Shah is the winner of multiple prestigious awards for her teaching, research and service, and she's a winner of the Institute for Public Relations Pathfinder Award in 2018. So welcome all to this panel session. So let's get straight into it. Um, firstly, for you, Bei Ling, um, going on the research that you're seeing coming through your journals, what are a couple of the key trends in measurement and evaluation that you're seeing? That's a really good question. Um, and I'm really, I think that I'm seeing three major trends for the Journal of Public Relations Research. First, we're seeing a lot of quantitative studies with data analysis using structural equation modeling. And if you're one of these really lucky people who gets to live their life without knowing what structural equation modeling <laughs> is, know that I envy you very, very much. But it's basically this super complex statistical method that's designed to test causal and directional relationships among multiple variables all at the same time. The second trend that we're seeing in Journal of Public Relations Research is um, network analysis, where researchers are looking at how entities are connected to each other and in what ways. 
And then the third type of research that we're really seeing more of is um, an increased, I think, valuing of people's lived experiences, which of course is studied with qualitative methods. And for qualitative work published in the Journal of Public Relations Research, I have asked manuscript authors to engage more intentionally with reflexivity, um, thinking about how their own personal experiences have shaped their research perspective. So that's kind of the overview. Um, and I don't know at what point, uh, Barbara, you want us to give a little overview of each journal, but I'm ready to do that whenever you want it. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. So uh, will I be able to share my screen? Should be able to, I think. Okay, great. Great. So um, this is my favorite color, in case you couldn't tell from my lovely plant. So for the Journal of Public Relations Research, um, it is one of the, um, I think, most prestigious public relations journals in the world. If you care about impact factors, which I know many practitioners do not, but academics do, um, our impact factor has increased quite a bit over the last five years. And in particular, the most recent rankings um, by journal citation reports coming out um, this past June of the 2020 rankings showed that our impact factor dramatically increased, as you can see, to 6.409, um, which a lot of the journals last year went up, I guess, because of the pandemic, people had nothing to do but stay at their house and read a lot of academic journal articles. Um, but more significantly, I think, than the impact factor is the ranking, which for Journal of Public Relations Research last year um, is now eighth out of 94 journals in communication, which puts it for the first time ever in the first quartile of all communications journals. And the Journal of Public Relations Research is indexed on all of the things that you see um, here on the slide, including especially, the, you do see the slide, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see. Okay. We've all been to those presentations where the speaker keeps talking, not realizing no one sees our slides. Um, but you can see that um, we are also indexed in the Australian Business Deans Council, which is apparently very important um, in um, Oceana for our folks there. In the coming year, we have several special issues and themed issues. There's a call for the global pandemics, which um, is currently being published. And then later this calendar year, we have a special issue coming out on women and leadership. And there will also be another special issue on faith, spirituality, and public relations. The most exciting thing, however, that I would like to share this year about the Journal of Public Relations Research is that it's my last year as the editor-in-chief. Um, and uh, Christine Huang has been my senior associate editor, and I know that she is equally as excited to pass the baton to our successors. And so here's our contact information, but really just ignore my contact information. If you have questions about the journal, contact the incoming editor-in-chief, who is Dr. Sung Yun Yang at Indiana University, and his associate editor, Dr. Nicholas Browning, also at Indiana University. So just ignore my information, write down his information, and contact him with all of your questions. Thank you. Okay. Maureen, would you like to share some information about Public Relations Review? Yeah, definitely. All right. Can you see that? Yes. All right. So Public Relations Review is actually the oldest journal dedicated to public relations research. And for many years, it served as this uh, link between the professional community, of which the people in the audience today are part of, and the academic community. And even today, we still have practitioners who serve on our editorial review board and submit papers to us. So we, we sort of form that bridge between uh, academia and the professional community. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me show you some stats of the journal. If we can from the current slide. And Bei Ling, I actually have an answer about why all of our impact factors went up because they recalculated how they identify impact factor. It used to be the last two years. Now I believe it's four years. So they were able to increase the size of the pool of articles. And that's how most of us saw a bump. 
So we saw a bump as well in 2000. And imagine, imagine that in the agency world, like a five-star agency. Well, for us, impact factor is like the, you know, the agency stars and the agency rating. For us, that's what gets us excited. So we've had a bump up to 3.448. Uh, we're an A journal and we do Q1 rankings and communication and Q2 in business, which is important for the ABDC. Uh, our story is... Uh, it's a, it's a very big story. We get about 500 submissions a year. And in 2018, I had 612 articles come through my door. Our acceptance rate, which is a, another measure, but not the only measure, is that about 15 to 17% of the articles get accepted, depending. Sometimes special issues have a little higher acceptance rate because the pool is smaller. And one of the things that, uh, I don't know if Bailey talked about it, but I have a really high rejection rate for desk rejects. So one of the things that we've discovered is as a journal's impact rating goes up, so does the number of articles that just get submitted to it just because the word public and relations might appear in their article once, not even the same two words together. So we, we uh, throw those out of scope and suggest they send them to other journals. Uh, about a third of our articles, at one point I thought about renaming the journal, the Journal of Social Media and Crisis because about one third of our articles are around social media and crisis. And the, the, the big finding for practitioners is people use social media in a crisis. Uh, about 25% of the articles use structural equation modeling. Uh, we are now seeing uh, MTurk and Qualtrics panel. So for those of you who are in the, who are in the uh, agency sector, uh, MTurk and Qualtrics can provide you with a decent panel for surveys and experimental design, if you're interested in going down that route. And uh, just a, a fun piece of information that Australia is the second largest contributor to public relations review, even before I moved from the United States to Australia. So there's always been this really strong core of uh, people. Many, many of the PhDs in Australia have their practitioner roots. And so that's what makes Australian public relations research, I think, so interesting. So I'm going to stop sharing. That's my journal. And then I will answer your question, Barb, about the key trends that I see. Uh, number one, for in my journal, there's still articles that are making an argument for measurement and evaluation. Remember that they're different, right? We want everybody to do measurement, public relations measurement. But evaluation is actually evaluating against a baseline of what you said you were going to start off to do. Uh, I'd say the second trend is this uh, uh, called substitution error. I know Jim probably presented last month or a few weeks ago, and that's a big thing that Jim and I work on with the WHO, is that we have a lot of people saying this is measuring this when it's not. And then the last thing that I'm going to say is that uh, a lot of people are using uh, practitioner data about the prevalence of measurement and evaluation as a basis for their articles. So I see that as well, especially from European scholars. So they'll do a large survey and then they'll say, look, 62% of uh, practitioners say that they wish they had more measurement and evaluation. This is a role for academics to kick in and to start giving them the skills and the tools that they need. Christine, over to you. Let's hear about your journals and um, your reflections on that question. Okay. Um, thanks for um, okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Actually, um, I now serve as a um, uh, chief editor for uh, communication and the public. Uh, mm -hmm. That is um, the, the journal actually is based in uh, Menon, China. It's an English um, uh, language um, journal. It is just um, like, you know, um, in, indexed in um, ESCI uh, index, that's emergent um, SCI uh, journal. And the other one is some um, communication and um, the society that is some um, Chinese journal. So today, because um, um, I would assume that most of um, the audience here is a public relations a practitioners or educators. So um, I do not, uh, you know, I, I, I do not intend to uh, talk too much about my journal. So actually today, um, um, what I've been uh, prepared um, is about like, you know, the, the topic on uh, public relations um, measurement. So I don't know if you want me to um, you know, go ahead and um, I'm doing that, or, you know, maybe I can wait until uh, the questions when that comes yeah. to uh, public relations management. Yeah, because Let's I do, do that, have... Christine. So yeah. um, you just bring up your slide when we get to the relevant question. That okay, sounds... so you want me to do do that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think I will spend like um, the next um, um, three to 
five minutes. Okay, three three minutes actually. Yeah, I will try my best to um, to talk about you know uh, the general observations about um, the indicators or the measurements of um, public relations um, evaluation. So basically, you know, um, in the past time, okay, um, three perspective are used as some um, the methods of evaluation, such as you know uh, the first one is major communication outputs, such as um, publicity volume, media reach, things like that. And the second one is um, uh, uh, called um, is entitled intermediate effect to assess uh, target audience attention, understanding, and feedback. And the, the third measurement is um, to measure the organizational goal achievement, such as some um, sales, uh, fundraising, things like that. And um, okay. And I would like to uh, talk uh, briefly about my personal views about an integrated model that I published in Journal of Population in 2012. Okay, so for this model, I identify uh, public relations um, effectiveness or values from um, two major perspectives. That is um, um, public relations effectiveness that consists of um, three dimensions. That is um, media publicity, organizational reputation, and um, Maureen and um, uh, Beijing just said about you know, organizational public relations. And the, the second, uh, dimension is about uh, organizational effectiveness that is mainly uh, measured by uh, revenue generation and cost reduction. And um, so for the media publicity, basically uh, it, um, it is very self-evident because you know, most of them, the practitioners will measure public relations from um, you know, the, um, um, the perspective of media volume, media reach, and uh, placement, prominence, things like that. And the, the second one, I think that is uh, more relevant to public relations um, research uh, that Maureen and Beijing just mentioned, because a lot of um, researchers would um, conclude that um, the, the major contribution of public relations to communicate the repu reputation of our organization. So, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the four um, indicators I list here is how usually we uh, measure organizational uh, reputations. And what I want to really emphasize here is that from um, the theoretical perspective, we actually do not equate uh, image perceptions and reputation the same thing. So um, reputation basically is um, uh, defined as you know, a more aggregated uh, and long-term um, um, perspective. And the, the third one is um, reputation uh, relationship management. That's what we call OPR. And um, this has been um, the major trend um, um, topic submitted to a journal PR research and public relations research recently. And uh, uh, five uh, variables has been measured extensively. That is um, control mutuality, trust, uh, commitment, satisfaction, and the other uh, face and favor. And then uh, this is what I call revenue generation perspective because some um, organizations financial performance, such as the business sales, stock values, um, in, uh, ROI, uh, have been uh, usually or commonly used as um, indicators um, to measure revenue generation. But what I want to emphasize here is that, you know, this uh, perspective basically adopted the paradigm of um, marketing um, instead of um, um, uh, public relations. And to the last one, that is my favorite, okay? Uh, that is um, to define public relations values from the perspective of cost reduction, especially conflict resolution and uh, crisis management. And as Beijing and uh, Maureen just mentioned, uh, crisis management and communication has become one of um, the dominant uh, topics um, for the uh, manuscript sub sub submissions. So, uh, uh, people or scholars would emphasize um, 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 from the perspective of like, you know, um, the reduction of lawsuit or oppositions from the activist group. Okay, so I think um, I would um, 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 stop here because um, this would be um, what I call the integrated um, models of public relations values. So when we talk about like, you know, uh, uh, measurement of public relations, I would really want to see it from, um, you know, how much or the, the values that public relations can generate to an organization. So um, maybe I can uh, elaborate more later.
Mm. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. I'm going to throw a curveball to you all because you all mentioned um, a, a focus on more of the um, understanding of the causal factors in um, public relations activity and results. And and um, Christine and uh, Maureen actually talked specifically about relationship management and crisis communication. And both of those can have a lot of causes for um, reaction and response to each of those. Um, is this a reflection of the public relations industry becoming more sophisticated about what those causes are? Perhaps Maureen, if you start us off. Sure, uh, I would think so. Uh, number one, I mean, cause and effect are, we all seek that, right, in our lives, predictability, to be, and also to be able to show that we, public relations can actually influence something. So I think cause and effect and influence are key factors in the profession, right? That's what we wanna be able to prove. Uh, we're still, if we talk about measurement, we're still trying to prove that public relations contributes to organizations and to society, right? At the heart of all of measurement in public relations is that, is that need the need to show that we contribute and that we add value. And so we, we cast about for whatever we can. So in the early years, it was media hits, right? So we would show, we got hits in the media, our news releases were getting published, we got our people on TV, then it was web, right? And then it was, we were using web metrics and it was social. So we're always searching about for ways to prove that we're having some type of impact. Whereas if we had actually, if, if practitioners and agencies actually started with the fundamentals of evaluation, a theory of change, a baseline, um, outcome measures, right? We would actually have a much easier time of proving what we do if we went back to the fundamentals of research and measurement and evaluation. Christine and Bailing, do you have any comments on that? Um, okay, yeah, maybe I can um, provide my um, ob observations. Of course, um, I think, you know, one of um, the dilemma that, uh, that has been faced by the population of practitioners and um, scholars actually, you know, uh, just as Maureen just mentioned that, you know, we have been trying to demonstrate our values to the organization or the society as a whole. And, but I, um, what I've been observing is that, you know, um, the paradigm that we have been um, um, adopting, um, you know, we all, uh, often uh, fall into um, the paradigm of um, what I just mentioned, the marketing. So we try so much to um, demonstrate or to illustrate or to prove, you know, how much money or financial um, 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 contributions that we can make for the organization. But at the same time, where, you know, um, the dilemma is that actually we have been um, a quite of um, a, a important thing is that, you know, since um, a lot of things that we cannot, um, um, a, 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 a minimum for um, among the population effectiveness have, might remain unaccounted for, is that, you know, only media publicity or revenue generation has been taken into account. Okay, and what remains unaccounted for is that um, you know the values of um, the organization that we keep a story out of um, a, a negative story uh, out of um, the media or the values of uh, the crisis lawsuit and uh, you know boycott. So I think that, that is um, the dilemma that we cannot you know have a reasonable um, um, mechanism to demonstrate uh, you know the unaccounted for part, but that may be um, the major areas that populations can really, you know, um, um, contribute to the organization or to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, distinguish its values from marketing. Yeah. So is it okay if I say something potentially controversial? Of course. I agree that, um, in terms of the conversation about measurement and evaluation, there's been a lot of talk about ROI. There's been a lot of talk about value to the organization, whether it's, as Maureen pointed out, historically media hits, ad equivalency, social media, reputation, and that's fine. What makes me really upset is I think we have lost sight of the true potential 
of public relations, which is the value that we potentially can bring to society and therefore to the world, right? I mean, all kinds of organizations hire public relations to do things that frankly are sometimes not super ethical. And our world, let's be honest, is a mess right now. It's a mess. The pandemic, the social inequity, the you know renewed awakening about diversity, equity, lack of social justice, what we're doing to the earth in terms of climate change. Um, so we should, by all means, be having conversations about the value of public relations and what we give to organizations. I would challenge us all to think bigger and to really reflect on the value that public relations can have for society um, because somebody has to fix this mess. Mm. So, Bailing, just extending on that, are you seeing any um, research coming through that can support that idea of um, really what you're saying is the public relations practitioners are the foot soldiers of change? Um, so is there research coming through that can support how that might happen and, and whether it might happen? Yeah, I would say there is some research coming through. Um, so, for example, um, in the United States right now, there's a big conversation renewed since the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020 about diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. And I was so pleased, Barbara, at the beginning of this session, how you acknowledge the um, indigenous peoples who inhabited the land on which you're currently working. Um, what I'm seeing right now is that research is trying to tackle these really big challenges. And what we're seeing in terms of public relations research is something that we have known, at least if you read Cutlip and Center's Effective Public Relations, which was first published in 1952, we have known for a long time that it's not just what you say, right, that makes a difference. It's what your organization actually does that makes a difference. And so public relations people being the foot soldiers, as you put it, Barbara, of change, we have the privileged seat of power to not just be the organizational voice out there to talk about what the organization wants us to say, but we really have the privilege, the power, and really the responsibility to say internally to our organization that we have to change how we do business. We have to change how we function. We have to change how we treat our employees. We have to change how we treat the earth. And if we really spoke up internally and took our rightful place in the dominant coalition of companies, I think we could be even more powerful and more effective and ultimately um, doing what our true calling is, which is making the world a better place, not just our organizations more effective. So, Christine, are you seeing any research that um, that could help the facilitation of that process? Um, let me maybe uh, answer these questions from the most recent research that is related to COVID-19 mm -hmm. that, you know, population, some researchers that, you know, uh, according to um, the like submissions that I've observed that, you know, that might, um, you know, um, be related to um, the aspects that um, Beijing just mentioned. Um, you know, when we talk about the values that populations research or practitioners or researchers can contribute to the society or the world as a whole, uh, we can see that um, the new research agenda that have been brought up, such as, you know, examine um, infodemics, disinformation, misinformation, rumors, okay, and, um, and um, also like, you know, um, how um, the public relations or the communication programs that, you know, can address um, the, uh, the pandemic uh, 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 produced or, you know, generated on um, um, the negative side of the employees, 
okay, such as psychological um, pressures or like, you know, um, the uh, 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 a lot of um, 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 distress, okay, or a lot of stress actually that happened in the workplace. So uh, we can see quite a few um, submissions in that aspect. So I'm, I'm thinking that actually um, I myself indeed observed or witnessed, you know, um, although that we, uh, given on um, um, the, the negative side of the pandemic, I, I can see that um, a lot of more interdisciplinary and, you know, um, 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 interesting um, research that have been brought about, you know, because of the pandemic into the field of population. Yeah. Maureen, what are your thoughts? Uh, I would think what I've been seeing in the past couple of years, um, there's been a renewed call for critical theory in public relations. And so uh, Public Relations Review publishes that regularly. And so we have studies on race and identity and the intersections of identities. So I think that's a, that's a good place to start. Uh, I would say that there's uh, interest in social capital as measurements of public relations outcomes. And so we're publishing that as well. Uh, we're not there yet, but I would say that's something that definitely could feed back into the um, into the into the system, and then I think that we're starting to see pieces that are critical of AI, and that's also something uh, new and much needed. So in some ways, you know, the journals are like the canaries in the coal mine, right? So things that we start talking about and thinking about. Right? Let's remember the, the the link between academic research and the profession is actually those who teach, right? Those of us who do research and then teach at the university level or consult, right? Because we have a huge teaching role when we go into organizations and consult for them to teach them about theory and practice. So all the things that I see happening. So, you know, in some ways I'm optimistic uh, because I am seeing these articles come through. Now, some of them don't get published, right? And that's unfortunate, but they do get published somewhere else. And although it's the, the, the journals that we're talking about today are some of the dominant journals in the field, there's the good thing about the field of public relations is it's grown so much. We have all these different journals now, journal of public interest, communication, right? Public relations inquiry. There is uh, there is a cadre of other journals that also can specialize and can share this information. But the real key truly for all of this is to move it from the scholar who does it, who publishes it into the classroom and then from the classroom into the profession. And they don't have to be, it's not just the classroom to the profession, but they're, they're together. And I think that's really our key. And that's why PRI and other organizations are so valuable. And it's always the greatest loss when I meet practitioners and they've never heard of the things that like we rattle off, like OPR, satisfaction, mutuality. I'm like, these are really valuable. And they're like, yeah, there's no money though for research. So we're just going to go on impressions and, uh, and an engagement measurement because that's what our, our company is, is giving us. So you talked about canary in the coal mine there, Maureen, and that sort of touched on one of the questions I wanted to ask is where are these developments are coming from? Are they driven by industry or are researchers seeing a need before industry realises it's a need? What's coming first? Oh, can I go first on this? Because this yeah, is... This. Okay. Our job as as teachers, as educators, is to instill a love of research and curiosity into our students who, when they go into the field, want to know why and what and how. So that's really, I think, our, the greatest thing is to be an educator and to, to teach them to love research so they're not scared of it, right? What's the most un, unloved class in the public relations curriculum, probably? Public relations research. And it shouldn't be, it should be the one that they love the most because it's tools for gaining knowledge and providing insights. So I'm gonna say that that's uh, one of the reasons that we haven't been able to see this huge growth, like in marketing, right? In marketing, they have no problem running a study or taking what they see in the literature and using it. We haven't done that yet. At least I haven't done that yet successfully in my classes. Christine, what are you thinking? Hmm. Um. I would say that, um, you know, um, these two fields, basically they, um, um, I would say that, um, I don't know if my observation is correct, but maybe I would provide um, my ob observations from um, the Chinese societies. That is, you know, mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan. 
Yeah, since um, um, in the previous time, I would say that, um, um, okay, at the very beginning, okay, I, I would say that like uh, 15 years ago, I would think that the, the practical world or like the, the marketplace, they actually uh, took the lead, okay? And then move on to the most recent five years, I think, you know, the, 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 the academic field, okay, they have already, um, um, the research has already, um, you know, have um, the potential to take the lead or, you know, um, to uh, shed light uh, of their interest to the practitioners because of um, um, a lot of um, um, internet or digital methods or like, you know, um, social media analysis, things like that. Uh, uh, quite a few advanced research methods has been used in the in academia. So um, a lot of, um, just as you mentioned that the, the or the, I think just mentioned that, that a lot of um, sophisticated the research methods actually have generated uh, quite a few um, very useful uh, 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 results to shed light to the practitioners. But of course, the, the, the one of um, the challenges that uh, uh, brought by um, the practitioners to the researchers is that, you know, uh, a lot of um, 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 practical uh, problems faced by the, the practical world is that, you know, um, they are driven, a, a lot of issues has to be driven by um, the uh, revenue related uh, questions such as marketing. So I would say that for this current stage, it's kind of like chaos and kind of like, you know, um, uh, I, I would see that a lot of um, interactions um, has been um, um, taken place or happening between these two fields. And I am, um, and, and actually, I'm very happy to see that because of um, the trend of like, you know, um, the, the, the convergence of um, the practical world and academia and um, interdisciplinary collaboration has been happening quite a lot. And actually, for, for example, my research right now, actually, um, I collaborate a lot with um, the, um, the, the, the professors from um, School of Engineering, School of Medical Health. Okay, and school of um, law and school of business. So you can see, um, so I can, um, so the mention to um, the, the practical world. So answering your questions in short, I will see uh, quite a few, um, uh, quite a lot of um, 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 opportunities are there. And so I, I would really encourage that um, the audience, if we have um, like um, the public relations practitioners that, you know, go beyond our comfort zone and to, you know, collaborate with them, the, the researchers from outside. So, Bailing, in Western society, would you see a similar timeline and a similar development of tools that are then taken up by practice? I actually see more of a disconnect between practice and academia. And I know that's one of your later questions, so maybe I'll just wait till you... Oh, no, keep going, keep going. This is a nice oh. conversation. Oh, do you want me to talk about the, yeah, the area of the right. disconnect? So I think there's two areas. The first one is complexity and the second one is purpose. So in terms of complexity, academics try to look at a lot of different variables all at once and things get really complicated very quickly, maybe overly so. And in contrast, I think the practice sometimes seems to oversimplify right, where you find one thing and you say, oh, that must be the explanation without really thinking about other possibilities. And so in terms of the complexity question, we need a happy medium. And I think that could best be resolved with teams of academics and practitioners working together to help each other and to inform each other and maybe find that happy medium between the academics who try to explain everything under the sun um, and practitioners who are very, very specifically focused. The second area of disconnect, I think really has to do with the purpose of why we do measurement. And Christine alluded to this, that practitioners are really trying to solve a very specific pragmatic problem. They just want the answer. <laughs> Let me measure it and find the answer and be done with it. Academics, aren't so concerned with immediate answers, as you can tell by how long-winded all of us are. Um, but academics are really more concerned with advancing theory, right? And I think what we forget is that theory and practice 
as Maureen said very well, inform each other. So even though practitioners are focused on an immediate problem, that effort can shed light on what is wrong with theory, which is broadly speaking, explanations for why stuff works the way they do. And academics in our focus on theory, um, trying to explain everything and predict everything, sometimes need to remember that that is a long-term luxury that practitioners don't have because they got to report quarterly findings next week, right? To Christine's point about ROI. So I think in the short term, the challenge is this lack of mutual respect and mutual understanding and the purposes for why we do measurement. But in the long term, theory and practice are mutually informative. And I just hope that we can work together to get there. So how do you think we might solve that problem? I might throw to you, Maureen. Uh, a couple things. Number one, um, having practitioners get masters and PhDs helps, right? So one of the things about Australia, which is really interesting, is there's this whole cadre of people who get PhDs who don't go into higher education, right? They uh, they go back and they work in the, or they work through in the field through their PhD, uh, write in a very applied dissertation, and then use their skill set in research and theory to contribute to their agency or the company that they might own. So that's number one. Uh, another way is for, for the professional career, for professional sector to actually listen to us, right? So that, you know, having us do three month internships, AAJMC has those uh, three month summer internships or month that people get to go into an agency in New York, San Francisco or Chicago, and we get to listen and then we get to talk about what we do. And it's really enlightening. And then I think just doing research that actually is accessible, right? Number one, uh, many of our journals are around are behind paywalls. So, uh, you know, it's really hard unless somebody goes through Google Scholar, which you should, because you can get most articles for free. Uh, and I, I think the writing as well, uh, I think the um, having an article be accessible, easy to read, you know, my eyes glaze over when I see structural equation modeling coming through the journal, journal inbox. I'm like, uh, and then I look, I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess there's a new variable here. Great. But we already know that all these things are causal to this. So I think accessibility and writing for multiple audiences. And we used to have a journal called public relations quarterly, which was before any of you were born, I'm sure. And it was like academics like me in the early years would take a, an article that we wrote and we would, we would write it in a more accessible way with no data and explain what it meant. And I, I think in some ways there's a, there's a need for that. And I think the Institute for Public Relations in the United States is actually doing a good job with that. They're taking academics and they're having them write uh, what it means and how they did it in a very accessible way. So Christine and Bailing, what are the journals doing to connect with practitioners that might enable us to bridge this divide? Go ahead, Christine. You want to go ahead? Oh, sure. So um, the purpose of the Journal of Public Relations Research is actually to advance the body of theoretical knowledge. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how many of my authors I have instructed to delete because of page limitations, the practical implications section of their manuscripts, partly because I don't have room, partly because it's not the purpose of the journal, and partly because they all say the same thing. They say practitioners should do better and use theory, right? <laughs> but what I've asked the authors to do then is save what they wrote and then we repackage it and we promote the scholarly piece through channels that practitioners actually use. Like Maureen was mentioning, I agree. Tina McCorkendale at the Institute for Public Relations has really upped their game in terms of the news briefing Here's what an academic study found, and here's why it matters to you on the front lines of doing public relations practice. I think that has been really, really valuable. Um, for myself, I think that um, the more that we can make things accessible, as Maureen says, via not just better writing, but also um, visual depictions, so infographics, 
via social media, Instagram, Twitter, all of these are other ways that we can make the scholarly work published in academic journals more accessible to people. Yeah. Okay. And Christine, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, Beling and Maureen have made um, no, quite very, very good points. Uh, what I want to add upon here is, uh, according to my um, personal experiences and my observations from the societies here. Okay, for my personal um, experiences, basically, um, no, I try, uh, I've been trying so very hard for the past, you know, two decades to like, you know, to teach at the level of um, MBA and EMBA level at the business school so that I can educate, you know, um, the future um, um, CEO or, or like, you know, um, a senior management to be so that they understand public relations um, values uh, better. This is one thing. And the second thing actually is that, you know, I try very hard to serve as a, like, um, you know, the consultant or the advisors such as uh, uh, for the practitioner of, uh, practitioner associations such as a public relations some um, practitioner association of Hong Kong of of um, the uh, uh, men in China and um, Taiwan so these are the two areas that I think you know as educators that we can uh, uh, we can contribute to the society and to uh, interact more with um, the practitioners and the, the, uh, the associations but on top of it um, I um, also um, would like to um, point out one indicators that I, I find that interesting is about the social impact, the term social impact, because we have been trying very hard as educators or researchers uh, to have a like academic uh, 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 impact such as citation. But um, one thing that has been emphasized here is about the social impact or like, you know, the social impact actually has been quite uh, intensively emphasized in the UK system. So, um, we usually think that um, knowledge transfer or like patent, you know, is far from us because that is like an engineering thing. But here we have already, you know, uh, implement quite a lot of, in, uh, you know, measurements uh, at, in the Academia um, Institute so that we can, just as Beijing just mentioned, that we can uh, 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 use some um, the layman language, you know, to um, um, export our uh, research results into um, um, uh, some kind of knowledge that can be easily understood by the, by the practitioners and by the lay people. So we, um, um, in addition to pu publish our journal articles, we also you know, are encouraged to, uh, you know, just as I just uh, mentioned that, you know, uh, translate our academic results into easily understand um, you know, coverage uh, in the media. Okay, like a newspaper or like, you know, we, we receive interviews from um, the, the, the uh, radios or, you know, televisions. So I think that all um, help to um, really, you know, bridge the gap between academia and the practitioners. And of course, between um, the so-called scientific orient oriented knowledge to like, you know, um, easily um, implemented knowledge. Yeah, so yeah, this is my two cents. Okay, well, we'll move over to audience questions now. And someone has asked a question that I wanted to, to ask anyway. Um, so based on what you're seeing coming through the journals, what sorts of skills in measurement and evaluation, probably learning, would you be recommending that practitioners be developing? Christine, no, I'll start with you. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, since um, I I um I actually um for for uh, for attending this conference, I look up some information, uh, especially um um, uh, there is a, a website called the Barcelona Principles. That is um yeah international association for measurement and evaluation of communication and i do find that um, you know some of them the interesting uh, points made in that uh, platform and i would like to um, you know um, to utilize some you know several points um, mentioned there and also uh, 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 um, you know add one more point by myself so um, yeah, I, I I really think that you know uh, uh, echo Beving just said outcome and the impact should be identified for stakeholders, organizations, 
but also society and the world as well. That is um, the first point that I would like to um, point out. And the second thing is that, you know, um, communication measures and evaluations should include both um, quantitative and qualitative. Mm -hmm. and both online and offline. I would really think that, you know, um, um, the measurement paradigm has actually been, you know, transforming a lot and evolving a lot. And I, I do think that, you know, um, it, it, just as I mentioned that at the very beginning or in the past time, um, practitioners usually use like, you know, a uh, 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 media output or like placement, things like that as some of the major indicators. But now I think, you know, quite um, um, diversified or, or, you know, um, methods should be really uh, considered. So even like, you know, our, what, what we call the ethnography or net, or net. ethnography, okay, online and and so uh, and not coffee actually is something that we can utilize to um, as a like you know communicate uh, uh, measurement tools, and um, and then um, um, I would really think that, that you know um, the holistic measures should be taken into account depending or subject to um, the goal of um, the corporations. So uh, just based upon like um, the five index or um, the five perspective that I just mentioned, I would really think that uh, not only to, in addition to like a communication output, okay, or like revenue generation, I would think that um, what we have been uh, working so hard on, you know, on the uh, uh, relationship, uh, trust, or like cost reduction perspective can really, you know, um, considered for the practitioners to utilize. And of course, for the future um, researchers um, to consider. Okay, my, um, that is my, um, the, the points that I would like to make. Berling, what can you add? I would say three things for practitioners to have access to the right skills for good measurement and evaluation. Um, the first one is know what you're actually trying to measure. I haven't moved around enough, so my lights have turned off. Um, oh, well, I probably look better in the dark anyway. So um, first, I think, you know, knowing what it is that you're actually trying to measure. So we talk all the time about measuring impact, measuring engagement, measuring reputation. But what do these terms actually mean? We don't even have an answer for that. Second, I think clearly distinguishing for evaluation purposes between outcomes and outputs. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we see academics and practitioners measuring outputs to evaluate their success when really they ought to be measuring outcomes in terms of actual changes in knowledge and attitude and behavior. And then the third suggestion that I have, which is totally self-serving, is that it would be great if the corporate sector would fund academic research via partnerships, because especially for those of us at public institutions of higher education, the state, the government is no longer supporting higher ed the way that it used to. Um, and so, you know, we really need help to be able to produce the work that's helpful to you. Maureen, I'll throw a new question to you. Um, what can industry associations such as the PRIA do to support PR journals and research more generally? Okay. Um, I think um, creating opportunities for practitioners and, and agencies and organizations to interact with practitioners and not, not just through Zoom meetings like this. This is good, right? This is a good start. But I think the embedding, I, I always am enriched uh, when I spend time in an agency or speak to practitioners. And I know that when they come in and uh, pitch to our students and have students do work for them, everybody benefits. So number one, closer relationships. And those have to be systematized and standardized. And so associations can do that through an internship pro program or something, whatever it is. I think that's, that's what, number one. Number two, I'm going to go back to the earlier question. I want our graduates to have a tool chest of indicators and outcomes, right? Not just outputs, but outcomes that they could they can look and they could say, here's what we want to accomplish. What am I going to do? And, and I want I want setting baselines to become the industry standard, right? That whatever you do, that there's a small baseline, qualitative, quantitative, it doesn't matter to me, but that there is the recognition that for you to understand impact and effect, 
that there has to be a space at the beginning of the world before or an evolving baseline year by year for campaigns going on. But I would argue if there was one takeaway, it's to get the practitioners and the academics together. And, you know, um, there could be things such as co-writing articles, right? So doing a special issue. I would love, you know, I, I do special issues like Bailing does as well. The, uh, you know, great special issue would be like having an article and having three practitioners reply to it <laughs> like, yeah, would be one way. Uh, it's not it's not that easy and nobody wants to do that because there isn't a, a, a payout. When, when practitioners discover that we edit journals, review and write articles for nothing, it's a, they're appalled. <laughs> Christine, do you have anything to add um, to the idea of support um, by industry associations for research and journals? Um, actually, I do not have them um, to, I, I think um, Maureen has already made quite yeah. good um, points. I don't have them, um, nothing. Can I add yeah. something no. though? Add, yeah. Yep, go, and then I'll go to Bailing. Right. Christine, I think actually, and I've said this many times when I've uh, spoken in China, China has the chance to do it right, right? So this is, this is a, the communication, the Chinese communication journal and other journals in Chinese. They have this opportunity not to make the same mistakes that we've made. So they can do their, their own culturally centered research, right? And they can create create links between industry and government and academics. So, you know, I, I still think there's great opportunity because it's still, everything is still being formulated and everything is in flux. And although it's chaotic, this is an opportunity for the academic sector to stand forward because educators are respected so much in China. Yeah, um, actually um, um, the professional um, associations um, um, in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan have been doing quite a lot. For example, they uh, hold like, you know, um, uh, uh, how can I say that? The, the, the best case studies, some um, competitions mm -hmm. at the level of um, university and at the, at the level of um, pr practitioners. And the, the results actually can be published in um, journal. But of course, that is um, like, you know, practitioner journals. So that can, um, you know, a uh, bridge uh, quite a lot between um, the, the the theories and um, um, the practice and um, the educators or the scholars um, serve as um, the judges. Okay, so that that is another venue that yeah. um, that can um, bring or just as I mentioned, um, you know, bridge the gap. And so that, um, for example, also for the researchers, some um, the students and and the, the practitioners. So the pro uh, pra uh, professional associations actually play um, a very good role on there of okay. course Christine you... we're running out of we've run out of time and I really wanted to hear from Bei Ling on this one so Bei Ling right. in 30 seconds what um, can you suggest for industry associations I have nothing additional to add and just thank you so much for having us. For well, this thank special. you so much all, um, Professors Bailing Shah, Maureen Taylor and Christine Huang. Um, this panel session is just one of a suite of activities that we've prepared for Measurement Month. We invite you to tune into our series of Measurement Month podcasts, um, Google Smoke Signal, where Paul Cheel host, um, hosts a number of um, podcasts. And we also have a wide range of M&E and communication research, research resources housed on the Educom portal, with, portal which is educompraa.wordpress.com. So thank you all for coming. Um, that's um, a terrific contribution to our Measurement Month activities um, and thank you all um, for coming to watch this webinar. Thank you very much.